So good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. I'm going to call this meeting to order. The purpose of today's meetings is to hear from two hospitals for their hospital budget presentations. The first will be Mount Escutney, and the second will be Copley. Um, after each of the hearings, the board will ask questions, then the healthcare advocate will ask questions, and then I will open it up to the public for comments on that particular budget hearing. Just as a reminder to the public that there is an open public comment period on now, and you can log on to our website and issue a public comment anytime in the next couple of weeks. So with that, um, Kim, if you could swear in the three people from Mount Escutney. Okay. Would you please raise, <coughs> excuse me, would you please, <coughs> excuse me, off to a good start this morning. First, I can't hear. Okay, raise your right hands, please. Do you swear the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I do. Thank you. And uh, just checking, I see Jess, Maureen, and Tom. Robin, are you on? I am. Super. So, Joe, whenever you're ready, take it away. Um, great. I, I, I assume someone will share our presentation? Or am uh, I... The way I the way I understand it, the hospitals um, in the guidance were um, informed oh, that they were okay. going to share. Okay. Uh, sorry, just give me a moment and I will bring it up. I thought we were not doing that so that we wouldn't have any funny business, but I will, <laughs> I will bring it up. Just give me a moment. Apologize. <laughs> yeah. Abigail, do I have that correct? Yes, there, you were right. asked, but if you can't, I'm happy to do it. Nope, nope, we coming along here. I want to know what that funny business could be. I don't know, you know, Dave, Dave Sandville. Is always... Well, that's true. <laughs> Say no more. <laughs> All right, getting. I had to take an oath before we get on here not to provide any shenanigans, so. We'll see if you can uphold your end. <laughs> Don't lose the humor, though. We look forward to your humor, Dave. Thank you. <sighs> Sorry about that. There we go. And. Yeah. How does that look? I can't see it yet. Okay. It is posted on our website too, just as a reminder, this is Susan Barrett speaking. Yeah, it's, I'm sorry, it's my uh, Microsoft Teams uh, inadequacy. I think we're getting there though. There you are. All right, just let me. Still there? Does it look better? It's still in the uh, mode where you see the other slides as well, but that's okay. How about this one? Now that's my screen. Yeah, it's still in the presentation mode, but that's okay. I mean, it. Instead of seeing one side, we're seeing the one no. big one and the three on the side, but that's okay. All right, let me. All right. I will get going then. Most of this is, most of the good stuff is narrative. Um, we all have it too in paper ourselves. Great. So. Super. As, as do I right in front of me. Um, so uh, thanks for, for having us this morning, uh, giving us a chance to share our budget and re review some of the work that we've been doing over the last uh, year. Um, uh, starting with uh, who's here, it's myself. Um, this is my eighth year at Mount Escutney, my uh, sixth year as the chief medical officer, and my fifth year uh, as both the CEO and the CMO. I, I looked at the uh, all the hospitals in Vermont last night. I I think as interesting as it as it sounds that I'm the 
the fourth longest serving CEO at a single hospital um, <laughs> in Vermont right now, uh, which is shocking to, to think about. Uh, Dave Sandville, uh, whom you all know well, is our CFO. He's been at uh, Montescutney for nine years, and Teresa Tabor, our, our controller, has been at uh, uh, Montescutney Hospital for 10 years. So we've had some uh, significant stability in our finance team, uh, which has been a huge help for us. Uh, this is what we'll go through today. We have a, uh, this is a very long presentation, but we will uh, try to move through quickly and really focus on uh, the, the important stuff. The obligatory drone shot of, of Montescutney Hospital. So, Joe, just so you know, um, you're not advancing your slides. So oh, the people really? Oh, all right. Jeez Louise, this is so <laughs> annoying. I apologize. Let's try this. Oh, my God. It says I'm sharing, which is interesting. Try this again. Screen share. Um, how about that? Is that working a little bit? Drone shot. Are you all seeing yes, the drone shot? We're Great. seeing the drone shot. Perfect. Um, so our, our mission, uh, again, to improve the lives of those we serve, our mission statement has not changed. That's one of our rehab, acute rehab patients um, in our vector gate training system. I, I believe that it's only us and Spalding that have this uh, uh, gate training uh, uh, system for uh, post-stroke and post-spinal cord injury patients um, in all of uh, New England. Our org chart has not changed. Uh, we remain a member, system member of Dartmouth Hitchcock Health, uh, and have been since 2014. Uh, I do want to call out our assisted living facility, Historic Homes of Runnymede in, in Windsor, Vermont. It has 40 to uh, to 50 uh, beds slash apartments slash rooms in the assisted living. It is a uh, an organization under significant stress right now due to staffing due to the pandemic, due to some uh, uh, leadership changes in the last uh, six months. It has been uh, a, a struggle for our entire leadership team to, to keep um, uh, HHR going through these uh, times. I think we're, we've, we're moving to a good place, but uh, it has been a significant um, uh, drain of, of resources at the hospital level going down to help support uh, the assisted living. Our current integration activities, I can summarize this by just saying there, there's really no aspect of our, uh, you know, our business enterprise or our clinical uh, service lines where uh, we are not fully engaged in integration. I would describe the first five years of our engagement with the system as um, involving kid gloves on both, both sides as we figured each other out. Uh, and I would say the last three years, it's been pedal to the metal. Um, let's start behaving like a system. Let's uh, do everything we can to reduce expenses. Let's rationalize how we deliver care um, across the region and also look for, for further regional partners. Our current service lines are on this slide. Uh, everything you see in red is directly supported by uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock Health with specialists. They provide one of our general surgeons uh, for four days a week. They provide a cardiologist um, one day a week, a gastroenterologist one and a half days per week. Uh, they do Dartmouth Hitchcock Health radiology, uh, uh, performs all of our radiology reads and procedures. We have a pain management specialist uh, that comes down a couple days a week. We also get support from DH for telehealth uh, in both emergency medicine and, and psychiatry uh, and uh, neurology. We hired the neurologist. It's been a long time search to help support our rehab hospital and heavy uh, stroke population on the inpatient side here 
at the hospital and on the rehab. Um, I want to also add that our physical med and rehab, neurology, um, uh, podiatry, uh, uh, psychiatry are all regional services since uh, many of those our surrounding neighboring hospitals do not um, uh, offer those clinical service lines. Uh, I always try to find an opportunity. This is a little bit tough to read, but I'll, but I'll summarize. These are the um, uh, 10 areas on, for inpatient HCAPs, patient satisfaction and quality surveys. Um, and uh, Manuscutney Hospital for the, for the last few years has uh, led the state of Vermont um, uh, in overall scoring. This past year, we, we were the highest ranking uh, hospital in seven of the 10 areas surveyed the year before, I believe we were eight out of 10. Um, and uh, this is the result of a lot of effort over the last seven years uh, to improve, to invest in our quality and safety teams, um, uh, to improve employee engagement. And the flow uh, really it was uh, almost a linear um, a linear progression in our patient satisfaction and quality scores as we invested in quality and safety and, and engagement. These are the two I'm, I'm most proud of. How well do patients rate the hospital? Uh, we have the highest um, scoring in, in the state and would the patients recommend the hospital to friends and family? Uh, same result there. Um, so with, with that introduction, um, I'll hand over to Dave uh, for the next few slides and then he will transition um, uh, back to me, Dave. I'm happy to be your your slide uh, advancer. Just let me know. Okay, thanks, Vanna. <laughs> um, so uh, we do have a lot of slides. So I'm really I know you guys are excellent readers. So uh, I'm just going to you know hit the high points on the finance slides, and then certainly if there's anything uh, that you want to have uh, for discussion or questions beyond that, happy happy to address them. Um, price increase, uh, our overall price increase for the year is 2.2%, and essentially what that equates to is a 2.5% uh, across the board inpatient, outpatient uh, physicians, um, but a 0% uh, increase in pharmaceuticals, uh, which becomes a, a weighted average of 2.2 uh, across all lines of business. Um, as for some perspective, um, for the last eight years, um, we have been on the lower side of the average price increase um, and uh, number six of eight for Vermont CHs. In other words, two CHs uh, with lower average price increases than us. So um, we've really uh, made uh, good attempts over the last several years to, to manage down our price increases. Um, and uh, as uh, you saw in our narrative, um, you know, uh, despite the low price increase, uh, we are having uh, an MPSR FPP increase greater than uh, the 3.5% allowed. Next slide. Uh, this is the PL, uh, essentially a 1.65% operating margin, a 3.6% total margin. Um, so it is what it is. Next slide. Uh, balance sheet. Um, obviously, very good investment market this year. Um, we've been having a good uh, uh, operating year as well, and so our balance sheet is uh, definitely stronger than in prior years. Next slide. Um, our cash flow, um, this may look a little bit different than what you have in front of uh, you. Uh, we really couldn't uh, make this work uh, for us, so um, we uh, converted these numbers uh, to something that matches what we use internally and what we use with uh, uh, the Dartmouth Hitchcock system. Uh, but essentially, at the at the end of the day, uh, we expect um, a negative flow of cash of two point seven million dollars uh, during the course of next year, and uh, mainly that is because of uh, capital investment uh, that may be lower if we decide to do some uh, uh, loans. Uh, to fund some or part of that, uh, but at this point, it's uh, in our budget as a cash as cash transactions, and uh, our capital is up from normal years mainly because we did so little spending last year, 
And uh, despite efforts to uh, make sure we spent uh, what we committed to this year, uh, lag times and availability of, of uh, folks to get in here is just killing us. And so we're gonna grossly underspend again this year. Next slide. Next slide. If that didn't advance, Dave, sorry. No, sorry. Um, so uh, some of the uh, assumptions that we used, um, I know there's been some discussion and we addressed it in the narrative, but um, this was a very difficult year to estimate. Last year I thought was difficult. Uh, this year was actually more difficult um, because we have really zero trend. Um, so we used what we budgeted for 19 and 20. Uh, we uh, looked at what we did in 19, um, how 20 went and how 21 is going. Uh, we tried to incorporate any consideration that we could come up with related to COVID, um, whether it was uh, relocation of services, um, additional staff needed to make sure patients are safe moving through our system, uh, and other known changes in operations. Um, really impatient, if you were to look at our statistics, um, our in-house patients are the ones with the biggest changes year to year. Um, early on in COVID, uh, we received virtually no swing bed patients unless they were recovering uh, from Dartmouth uh, or other facilities and needed uh, skilled level of services in our swing bed unit. Uh, acute has gone up uh, mainly because we've been a, a COVID accepting facility and uh, we've had a, a great deal of um, uh, services referred to us from other facilities uh, because they did not feel they could provide those services. Uh, inpatient rehab also took a big hit during COVID, although it's come back to normal numbers at this point in this year. Um, so really, we're kind of just right-sizing uh, back to normal in-house levels for FY22 as compared to say 19 or pr prior. Um, if you were to take 20 and 21 out of the, uh, the data trend, uh, you would see that our, our average inpatient census and our utilization has stayed pretty consistent over many years. Next slide. Uh, I'm not going to go through these, but uh, uh, suffice to say that what we did is we looked at how we were trending as 21 really seemed to get some, well, we got some traction. Um, uh, we had to go back and look at prior years and uh, um, uh, generally uh, if I were to make an assumption over FY21 annualized um, our our budget for FY22 isn't that much different on the outpatient side. I will tell you that um, over the last few months our ER we have historically budgeted 13 to 14 patients a day. Uh, we are now running over 20 a day and we've had days as high as 41 within the last two weeks. So we are being uh, crushed uh, right now in the emergency room. Uh, lab testing, I'm sure with everybody else, uh, is up significantly this year uh, for the testing in the pandemic. Uh, and uh, most other uh, departments are performing fairly well. Next slide, please. Uh, clinics is a mixed bag. Uh, we knew that primary care would uh, volume would go down uh, this year, and it did. Uh, we are functioning pretty close to budget in that regard. Uh, we've lost a couple providers in primary care, which has put a little pressure on meeting volume targets. Um, we did close down the Ottaquichi Health Center uh, from uh, COVID testing and had everybody come to the main facility. Uh, and uh, so that affected their volume pretty significantly over uh, the last year. Um, psychiatry, um, we, we are kind of blowing out that budget currently uh, as we have three FTEs, but we have uh, one of our uh, psychiatrists who will be uh, uh, starting that glide path towards retirement. And uh, that accounts for most of the decrease in psychiatry. Um, rheumatology is increasing 32%, mainly because that was uh, hardly uh, seen here. We have a, a very part-time service and with the complications of COVID um, that uh, uh, FY21 performance was significantly down. Oncology has actually been surprisingly solid this year, uh, but we expect it to go back down to more normal levels, which is a 50% uh, reduction in that clinic. 
Uh, our specialists are performing fairly well and we expect them to continue. Uh, neurology was a new service that we budgeted for FY21 and uh, we are sharing that uh, provider with the VA, uh, but uh, she is very productive and uh, that's actually turned out better than expected. Next slide. Um, no, no significant changes in commercial reimbursement rates. Uh, Medicare, um, again, predominantly uh, cost-based reimbursement. Um, we did uh, um, assume uh, that sequestration would come back into play at some point during this uh, next fiscal year. Um, depending on how long this pandemic uh, lasts, we'll see if that holds true. Um, Medicaid, our assumptions are basically the same. We know that they would uh, typically lose some ground on inflation, um, but nothing radical compared to historical filings. Next slide. So, uh, you know, the change in net patient revenue increase, um, a very large increase uh, for um, these years. And uh, again, we already talked about the uh, rate uh, changes are all 2.5% with the exception of pharmacy, which we base off of, uh, of actual costs. So we don't, we don't just add a, uh, an inflationary increase on that in any year since I've been here. Next slide, please. Uh, we, we have no provider transfers. We have no uh, reporting or accounting uh, shenanigans. Um, uh, material price changes in ancillary services is something that uh, is not entirely recognized in our budget. And what I mean by that is that uh, um, because we're having a solid year, we've taken the opportunity to reduce some pricing in some of the areas that we were very high and expensive in. Um, at this point, uh, actual price increases annualized that we have put in over the last couple months uh, are totaling about $1.5 million in gross charges. Um, so when we say we've uh, filed for a 2.2% increase, uh, when we put through the last couple that uh, I actually have sitting on my desk right now, um, will probably be functionally a 0% uh, rate increase across the board. Next slide, please. Uh, so other operating uh, and non-operating, pretty much standard fare for us. Um, we do put a, a $150,000 subsidy in grants, uh, 340B, uh, no significant change. There's some uncertainty with blueprint funding, which I'm sure you're all aware of, uh, and 5% uh, uh, investment income return and fundraising of 250000 This is pretty much what we budget year in, year out. Next slide, please. Uh, expenses, uh, 2 to 3% increase for all employees. 2% uh, will go into effect as of 10 one And then we'll do uh, additional markets as affordable uh, for the other remaining percentage point. Um, we have a fairly small increase for health benefits, which I think you're seeing at most places because a lot of folks, our, our, our loss runs, so to speak, uh, have stayed down with COVID although we're, we're picking up uh, in that area. Um, we're gonna have a 3% contribution for 403B for our employees. Um, as a reminder, we terminated our pension costs last year, which is a savings of a few hundred thousand dollars a year, uh, which is recognized in tw uh, 22 completely. And uh, we do have an increase in FTEs next year, 3.3%. And uh, an overwhelming majority of that uh, is related to COVID, uh, either uh, front door, you know, it's door screeners, um, managing any vaccine or booster clinics that we'll be doing in the respiratory clinic that we're running. Next slide, please. No, it's, oops. Sorry, Dave. There you That's go. Okay. Uh, really not a lot to talk about in uh, non-salary. Um, pretty much everything is, uh, the, the one may be notable on here is purchase labor, which I'm sure you're hearing from everyone else. We've had more travelers in this last year than we've had in probably any two years combined since I've been here. And uh, that's despite uh, very high employee engagement scores. Um, 
uh, fairly low turnover. Um, it's, it's just really been a struggle for us this year. Um, but we also um, have uh, outsourced our anesthesia professional component. They were employed and uh, next year they'll be purchased labor. Actually, they are right now. We changed uh, mid-year this year. And uh, additionally, we're also working with Dartmouth uh, to uh, um, kind of pick through opportunities for uh, shared labor between the organizations. And I think uh, as Joe kind of touched on in the slide about all of our specialties, uh, one of the benefits that we are getting from them is, is sometimes it's, you know, we just need two days of a doc or two days of a, a certain specialist and we're able to contract for that. Uh, a lot of times when I've been in other facilities that didn't have a relationship uh, in this with the system, you know, well, we only need uh, 0.6 urology, but we can't get any, we can't get a 0.6, so we have to have a 1.0 and we really don't have the uh, the volumes or the uh, population to justify that. So we're a little bit more efficient in that regard uh, as being for being part of the system. Next slide, please. So margins, we can just go to the next slide, Joe. Um, this is, uh, I always like to pro uh, uh, provide some perspective. Um, Matt Scottney had some uh, um, kind of a sordid history and really what we've tried to do, uh, starting with the Kevin Donovan era, era and uh, now with Joe Paris is really try to, you know, get back what uh, had been lost uh, many years ago and get back to uh, a place of day's cash and, and things that would uh, uh, be triple B, triple B plus rated. Uh, and uh, the purpose of this graph is really to show, um, you know, where did we break even from 2011? I started the last month of fiscal year 2011 and uh, we went into a major computer conversion in uh, that month and through 2012 and you can see that large negative blip in 2012 and and some improved uh, trending of performance since then and you'll see on the right side the break-even line of kind of um, going into 21 uh, we had kind of gotten to uh, or it, with projected 21 gotten to a break-even uh, for all of those years. And this is just a cumulative, um, uh, a cumulative measure of that. Um, uh, next slide, please, Joe. And then this is, uh, for those of you who've been kicking around the state, we used to use this chart at, uh, at Gifford for many years. We called it the chaos chart. And uh, it's everybody's performance against uh, what they said they would do. And the, uh, uh, the blue line is is us. So what we're measuring there is what did we say we were going to do one year and then how close did we come to it? Uh, zero being the goal. And uh, the uh, as a system, you can see the orange line uh, is, you know, pretty much operating at zero for for the system. And again, I'm measuring change in percentage. Uh, I'm not measuring dollars here uh, per se. And uh, so we've we've become one of the more consistent. Uh, there are about three other CAHs who have been uh, more consistent than we have been at predicting ourselves over time. Uh, and uh, we are in the upper half of all hospitals as well. Next slide, please. And I think uh, I'll, I'll jump back in here for the uh, for a big chunk of slides coming up. Um, we were asked to comment on you know the risks that that we have have faced in 21 but specifically in 22 and obviously we're all living in uh the time of delta hopeful we are hopeful that uh the modeling is correct and that will um uh, that, that delta will peak as far as inpatient and outpatient cases uh over the month of september and um and then hopefully decline quickly uh at the end of september into october i think there's also some hope that the widespread and uh, highly virulent nature of Delta will suppress uh, other variants, at least for a bit, as Delta, as I said, has has, has swept across the country quite quickly. Um, uh, and, you know, our, our challenge is how do we ma maintain our three-phased approach to the pandemic when we're suffering both acute and chronic labor shortages? We committed from 
uh, you know, the end of March uh, to uh, rapidly expand our, our testing and respiratory evaluation capacity with a designated respiratory clinic. We built out a uh, acute COVID unit in our hospital um, and committed to uh, caring for both acute, post-acute and acute rehab patients with COVID, uh, basically all comers that did not require uh, critical care or intubation, we, we took all of those folks. And that includes patients from other EDs and other hospitals around uh, New Hampshire, Vermont, and, and New York. Um, it's one of the reasons uh, why we did not, or I should say why we recovered uh, quickly after falling off the uh, financial cliff in, in, in March, uh, we were able to keep our, our inpatient units full. It was a big stress on our docs, our staff, um, uh, but we provided care that our surrounding communities need uh, needed um, and continue to. As recently as last week, we had three COVID inpatients, although we're starting this week with uh, zero. Um, but we are running out of staff um, and it has become a challenge uh, as all the per diem staff, all that extra FTE um, that we had to take on to man our vaccination clinics, uh, our nursing units, um, and our assisted living for that matter, um, you know, have either returned to their old jobs or left the workforce. Um, we've had, there's been significant uh, 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 comp pressures, and we've had to um, uh, repeatedly uh, even during the pandemic, uh, make changes in uh, comp across the board so that we can both recruit and retain our our workers. I've said this before at budget presentations. You know, we have there are significant regional pressures being uh, you know 20 25 minutes from from DH as they compete with Boston for significant talent. Uh, they the uh, wage and, and benefit expense um, uh, is significant, and as uh, uh, as they make changes, we have to make changes as well. We are trying to uh, act as a system uh, when there are significant changes, say in nursing comp or technical positions, um, which uh, doesn't help us uh, from a budgeting standpoint, um, but I know it definitely does not help um, our neighboring non-system member hospitals who then have to make changes uh, to keep up uh, with what we have to do. Um, and just keeping in mind that there is a new patient tower at DHMC um, going up will, that will require, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of new nurses and other staff uh, to operate uh, within the next 18 months. Uh, other risks, uh, you know, our ACO in engagement is staying the same for 22. We remain in Medicare, Medicaid, and the Blues of the commercial exchanges as approved by our Board of Trustees. Um, I would say there's split organizational enthusiasm around increasing engagement, um, even with upside uh, only programs. Uh, it is, we, we, there's a phenomenon with inpatients when uh, there are these folks that things always go suboptimally for when they're admitted to the hospital, either a medical mistake is made, a trans something gets lost in the transition, these kind of snake bit uh, patients in the healthcare system. Uh, there's a, a sense among our board and, and our leadership team that we've kind of been the snake bit hospital um, <laughs> with uh, the next uh, with the next gen uh, ACO. I'm happy to go into more of that later in the in the presentation. Uh, but our, our road has been um, uh, a rocky one. Uh, but there are other real, um, beyond just uh, uh, financial risk and reporting risk and accounting stresses. Um, you know, we, we the the uh, all of our specialty and expensive care for the lives that are attributed to us, such as orthopedics, psych, all specialty care, critical care. That all. For us, that all happens at, at, at Dartmouth Hitchcock. You know, most of our region's orthopedic care happens in New Hampshire, whether at Alice Peck Day or at, at Dartmouth Hitchcock, and even some at Valley Regional over in, in, in Claremont. So we have um, we have limited control over some of the uh, most of the uh, expensive care that occurs for our attributed lives. Uh, as I mentioned, we we are um, uh, 
dealing with wage pressures and then the you know, uncontrollable inflation, especially around the cost of PPE. Um, the insurance products, Dave, uh, will, probably, will probably comment on the huge increase in premiums across the board um, uh, that we've had to face as an organization. Um, we always make a point uh, of this uh, around trying to thread the needle um, of system needs versus our local hospital needs versus ACO needs and 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 what uh, uh, we can do from a budgeting uh, standpoint. Um, this is a challenge uh, every every year. Um, we're getting a little bit better, I think, on the system side. Again, as we've determined and over the, or, or as we've evolved over the last uh, seven years or so, and and what we do well. Um, and uh, kind of lines of business that we're likely not going to get into, which you know functionally hurts us budgetarily. It'd be if I had a four or five fourth uh, person orthopedic program, uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't have any worries um, uh, financially. But that's just not uh, really what the system needs, and frankly, not what uh, our region needs. Considering what's at DH, what's at Valley Regional, uh, and what's at Springfield. Uh, we continue to have a high proportion of subacute patients on our swing unit. Um, uh, I know folks on on the Greenmont Care Board remember the the data from the sustainability uh, work that we've all been engaged uh, with uh, with the Greenmont Care Board. Um, Montescutney and UVM uh, had the highest um, uh, utilization of inpatient beds in, in the state in the high 70s. Uh, for us, you know, most of those patients are subacute. While uh, this past year we've had a really a doubling of our of our acute inpatient volume uh, due to COVID and other pressures, and also uh, uh, driven by our uh, almost doubling of our ED visit volume um, as well. Generally, we're full of swing patients, and that is uh, tough to float the bottom line on. And you know, as Dave mentioned earlier, there's Yearly, there's ever increasing dependence on other operating revenues. We've really met work to maximize our opportunity within 340B. Uh, we get, uh, we bring in uh, around $1.2 million in grant funding to support our community health uh, initiatives. I have a slide coming up describing some of our work um, with uh, prevention grants for tobacco substance abuse. Uh, in coordination across the, the state, but Jill Lord, our director of community health, does a phenomenal job bringing in money to support, um, you know, the community health efforts that otherwise do not get reimbursed. Opportunities, um, we are continuing to work very closely with Valley Regional Hospital in Claremont, New Hampshire, and we feel that we know that that work will accelerate in 2022. Um, we, uh, did spend a significant amount of time, six to eight months, uh, working on possibly bringing together a kind of a three hospital microsystem in our region between us and, and Valley and, and, and Springfield while, while, while Springfield was in bankruptcy. Um, at, the, at the time, the end result of that work was a, a proposal um, that the leadership at Springfield at that time and their board and their um, bankruptcy attorneys um, did not um, uh, want to pursue, so they, they have remained independent, but the work with Valley uh, continues to move. Um, we share managers, we share directors, we are constantly looking to um, fill in holes for each other's organizations. This, right now, it's been on the management side and on the director, uh, director level, uh, but we hope to uh, bring together pools of technical workers, rad techs, respiratory therapy, um, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, who can move between the two campuses. We're 17 minutes apart, and while we're in uh, two different states, uh, we feel like we can um, continue to move that along until um, uh, th there is uh, limited. There, there is a, uh, there are limits on on senior leadership sharing uh, between the two hospitals, as uh, Valley Regional is not in Dartmouth Hitchcock Health uh, as of now. Um, but we, we do expect further consolidation to occur, uh, to occur over the next uh, 18 months. Uh, we are working to increase and improve some service lines. Uh, urology has been a, um, a struggle for us, really just 
uh, personnel mismatch. Uh, we have a locums uh, urologist now to, to so that we don't lose um, too much of the momentum. Uh, ultimately, we would like to have a single urology program um, serving uh, uh, Scutney and in, in, in Valley. Um, uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock is out of operating room space and capacity at this point. At at, at some point, uh, I would expect some surgeons to make their way down to our uh, ORs, which are wildly underutilized um, currently. Um, but that's a, a, a tough sell. Uh, I worked at DH for almost 14 years and lived close to the hospital up there. And folks don't want to drive down to Windsor uh, when they can get uh, some OR space at Alice Peck Day or New London Hospital in New Hampshire. So, uh, you know, we, we've extended that invitation to surgeons that do want to come down and do work here. But right now, there's really no immediate plans uh, to do that. Hopefully, it happens at, at some point to keep our staff busy. Uh, uh, won't spend too much time in this. This is just raw da data of our attributed lives in uh, Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, these questions we were asked to respond to around our value-based uh, care uh, participation. A as I said, we we are in uh, uh, all three of the core programs, and we'll um, uh, plan to do that till uh, until the end of uh, version 1.0 of of One Care Vermont. Um, I, I, to provide a little context for our response, I'm I'm the incoming chair of the Rural Health Services Council for the AHA and um, uh, describe our experience as a rural hospital in a next-gen uh, Medicare ACO frequently at, at national meetings. And uh, I'm often met with uh, surprise uh, looks around the table from other rural hospital and rural health system CEOs on, on uh, how it's possible that uh, Vermont's kind of been the tip of the spear uh, with, with so many rural hospitals. Uh, I think there was a, a, a fundamental flaw, uh, I wouldn't call it fatal, but a significant flaw when we left, the state left a, a, a huge amount of transformation funding um, available from CMS at the time of the ACO's uh, founding. Um, you know, that's led to hospitals and having to fund the transformation while putting themselves at risk when, you know, our budgets typically oscillate around uh, 1% or negative 1% operating margin uh, year after year. And again, I'll say for our experience, uh, thinking back to the um, the metaphor I used before as that one patient that bad things happen to all the time, that uh, at some level it's felt that, felt that way. But um, again, I've spent a lot of time um, speaking with national uh, rural health leaders as well. And um, I'm not sure anyone's convinced that the, the current model of next-gen Medicare ACOs are ideal for critical access hospitals. Um, uh, we, we were very, we were, I think, reasonably well situated to move into value-based care because of the uh, uh, work that we've done and, and all the other hospitals have done around Blueprint um, and our community health teams that provide complex care management uh, in the outpatient setting. Um, the, the population health management funding through the ACO has allowed our clinics to bolster nursing staff. It's been uh, uh, very helpful. Um, and the, the, the data that we get, from, uh, I believe, is the most, uh, most important aspect of our relationship with OneCare is the data that does allow us to identify areas of need for individual patients and for, and for populations. Um, when you only have some, anywhere between 1,000 and 2,000 uh, attributed lives, um, you know, the populations become thinner sliced and moving the population health needle becomes more challenging uh, with a small N. Um, but there have been individual and anecdotal cases where we've identified folks uh, that for some reason slipped through the cracks with our EMR and our primary care setting. Um, and our one care data allows us, has allowed us to identify them and reach out to them to prevent um, uh, ED visits, hospital admissions, et cetera. Um, what factors support or inhibit hospital participation in more value-based uh, payment programs, i.e., what is the tipping point or threshold? Um, you know, Dave and I have spent a lot of time uh, on this one. I, 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 it's, it's hard to come up with what a true threshold is. As I said, we've been all three of the core programs um, 
uh, for the last few years and will continue to, to do so. We fest, uh, face some stress from being uh, uh, right on the New Hampshire border. About a third of our business is New Hampshire based and, and therefore is, is fee for service. Uh, we've had migration of patients from uh, other HSAs, uh, which can sometimes con uh, uh, complicate uh, the accounting required to, to keep track of everyone's care and the finances associated with that. Um, we've had, you know, issues with shifting attribution. Um, COVID and, and uh, has obviously skewed everything for the last 18 months and suspect will uh, continue over uh, over the next year. Um, and again, I'll go back to that point. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but but having to fund the transformation um, it really, I think, started started the state off on the wrong foot um, in building the network within the a ACO. Um, as I said, we have, uh, in response to this question, we, we have developed systems and abilities to manage largely through our, our Blueprint Foundation. Um, uh, if we truly got to a point where, for example, maybe we had uh, global budgets uh, like the Maryland model, which I think is um, uh, maybe the best model to, to move toward, I, I think we'd still need additional uh, staff, um, again, in a tight labor market um, to really to move that to, to shift to uh, true population health. We, need to, we would need to meet patients where they are which is not in the clinic and not in the hospital. I used to say we need to keep people out of the hospital. Uh, now I'm saying we need to keep people out of the hospital and out of the clinic and meet them where they are in their homes uh, in urgent care. We need to look. We need to be. If we're going to be the tip of the spear with innovation, we need to look at hospitals, uh, hospital at home care. We need to ramp up our relationships with home health agencies, which which who are also under great stress from a, a staffing and a reimbursement um, standpoint. Um, uh, but these are the things again at national meetings um, that I'm that I'm hearing that larger health systems are are in, are investing in as they move toward uh, true value based uh, reimbursement and care delivery. And it'd be nice if we could actually show that what we're doing is actually improving access, quality, and outcomes. Uh, I think it's um, uh, it's hard, uh, you know, four years in. Uh, to show any of that data, it takes a while in, with population health efforts, as I said, to, to move the needle. Um, and uh, I, I'm a I'm a believer in, uh, frankly, Medicare for all. Uh, Dave, close your close your ears, um, or or some form of um, uh, universal coverage or universal primary care uh, within um, uh, Vermont to make things uh, better for our, for our patients and our communities. Um, but it's going to take uh, a significant amount of more transformation funding to get there. Um, uh, I won't delve um, too much um, in there. Um, again, we we have been engaged. We we did draw the limit at with the three core programs. Um, again, that was a board of trustee decision. Um, I would say our our senior leadership team is probably split down the middle and and how uh, they view our our ACO uh, participation um, so much so that e even even this year we even with upside only savings programs and some of the private insurers uh, we, we felt that that was uh, not something we could take on um, at this time Dave you want to take over from capital budget Um, yeah, so you know, again, as I mentioned earlier, um, we're going to be doing a lot of catch up from 20 and now 21 uh, in FY22. And uh, uh, so usually we run somewhere between 2.5 and $3 million in capital spend budget. Um, so this is nearly double that. Um, we do not have any CONs for 2022. However, uh, we expect to file a CON in 22 for FY23, and that will be for IT integration uh, onto the Dartmouth-Hitchcock platform uh, for both uh, the, the electronic medical record, other clinical applications, and all of the financial applications as well. Next slide. 
and and this uh, this is all stuff you guys have seen uh, with one addition. Um, the biggest the biggest issue we have right now <clears throat> is bandwidth, uh, getting some of these projects through uh, while maintaining uh, access for patients because all of our all of our clinical folks are are you know, uh, as with most CAHs, if not all CAHs, our managers are working managers. They're doing patient care. They're doing whatever they, they need to do. And sometimes that, that causes us to have bandwidth issues if the project is planned at a time where uh, we're very, very busy uh, on the floor or in a particular outpatient department. And so those are, you know, we do our best to, to, to get the capital done uh, in the period uh, budgeted, but sometimes uh, um, Murphy's Law, uh, if we have to pick between getting the, the four new EKG carts rolled out or, or taking care of uh, patients on the floor of the ER, the floor in the ER win every time. So next slide. And I think this is back to you, Joe. Yep, I'll, I'll take this. We were asked to comment on the impact of COVID on uh, access to care and wait times, use of telehealth and telemedicine, COVID-19 related safety protocols, and other relevant factors. Um, I, I want to stress on this slide, this is for non-urgent emergent visits. Um, anyone that has a urgent general surgery, medical, neurology, uh, et cetera, issue, they will they will get in that day. We've got a devoted group of providers that that uh, uh, make room for people that need to be seen urgently and emergent, uh, urgent, emergently. Um, this does you know, show that we've got a lot of one day a week providers, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, and there can be significant wait times um, uh, to get those people in uh, uh, for, for new visits. It's something that we, uh, you know, have worked on. Um, I think the small hospitals in Vermont, New Hampshire, sometimes think that Dartmouth Hitchcock has this uh, huge bench with a lot of depth and can just provide services uh, to everyone, you know, two, three, four days a week. And that's, they don't. I, 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 I work with their section chiefs uh, frequently trying to find some extra help. Uh, and uh, it is uh, challenging for them to find the personnel who can come down to uh, our place to uh, provide care. As far as the COVID impact on these numbers, I would say each has crept up a bit. Some have crept up uh, significantly more like podiatry and that reflects the closure of podiatry practices around the region and our we have one podiatrist and one nurse um, uh, who has been extraordinarily busy uh, even during the pandemic uh, foot care never took a break um, and it's the same with uh, ophthalmology there have been a number of area practices closing um, so our, uh, our our volumes there have have increased again we we have plans to consolidate some specialty services uh, at either Mount Escutney or at, at, at Valley Regional over time um, so that we can provide more robust services at one campus as opposed to um, you know one or two days uh, on two different campuses. I think it will be better for better for patients, for access, better for providers. Um, we uh, increased like every other hospital you're hearing from this year, we rapidly increased access to telehealth options for our entire patient population. We actually had, for all the complaining we do about our EMR, um, the our Cerner-based solution for telehealth was actually quite good. Um, it did identify some problems. We didn't have enough of our primary care visit uh, patients enrolled in our portal, so we did significant outreach efforts to get them uh, enrolled, uh, which is important outreach that we needed to do and then had to do very quickly. Um, we probably flexed up to about 35 or 45% or uh, early on in the pandemic that were telehealth in our primary care populations, um, but then quickly fell down to 5%. Why? It's um, We've, we've got a heavy Medicare, Medicaid uh, population um, that, that at least in our neck of the woods, did not really embrace uh, telehealth or broadband access issues, other demographic issues, especially with our very heavy Medicare uh, population and some um, uh, inability to embrace the technology there. And frankly, we had some provider dis dissatisfaction. I think everyone was enthusiastic early, uh, but then um, patients and providers missed having folks in clinic. We actually were hopeful that a sustained 
presence of telehealth would help to solve some of our staffing woes around flow mix, uh, around our patient flow uh, uh, techs, around our nursing. Um, because if we have a, if there's a lot of telehealth, you know, we we suddenly aren't as pinched from a staffing perspective. But that hasn't been borne out, and we're back to being, um, you know, hungry for more patient flow staff and in, in nursing. Uh, psychiatry went up very quickly and stayed up for telehealth support that has been and we have actually added over the last two years two more psychiatrists to the team uh, which is much needed considering the explosion of behavioral health needs in the region during the pandemic um, so we have significant backlogs for screening endoscopy that we're working uh, uh, to uh, reduce um, the, the uh, our, our workforce has been incredible in their adaptation to our safety protocols and um, uh, spacing of patients and our respiratory clinic and keeping the sick and COVID suspected segregated from um, uh, folks coming into our clinics for other um, evaluations uh, that that has worked out uh, reasonably well um, and I, again most of our access and capacity issues now are exclusively due to staffing and labor shortages we've we've had to close some inpatient beds um, as, as I mentioned earlier we we tend to run full and have been for last seven years uh, but we've actually had to close some inpatient and swing beds uh, because we just don't have the nursing staff uh, in August. Hope that that was amplified by very much needed uh, vacations, and uh, we, we we do think there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And we've had successful um, uh, nursing recruitments uh, over the last uh, month, uh, so we do feel that the cavalry is on the way. Uh, we were asked to comment on COVID-19 impacts on everything. Um, so it did impact everything. <laughs> uh, we made some good decisions as, as a system early on, which uh, probably hurt a little bit um, financially. Uh, but as we called on folks to help recover, both clinically um, and, uh, in, and financially, uh, as the pandemic wore on, I think they were good decisions. So we 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 did not have any layoffs or furloughs at our hospital or or across Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. We did um, hold on recruitment and froze hiring for for non-critical positions. We definitely reassigned staffing. I recall looking out my office window on a one of the many uh, Zoom meetings and seeing uh, a couple of our physical therapists doing um, doing some raking and and cleanup um, in the late. Late spring, our again, our staff has been incredibly adaptable here. COVID certainly did push some staff on the uh, our provider staff into retirement. Folks that were on a one or two year glide path said, "This is enough." Uh, you know, I don't want to end my career in in um, in a hazmat suit every day. Um, we did add 12 FTEs uh, for screening, COVID clinic, and vaccinating. That's uh, uh, 26 people's worth, and that's that has been an FTE variance that we look at every single week. Um, I chose one example on the impact of COVID on our community, and that's with substance use disorder. Our Windsor County overdose death rate rose dramatically. Um, we have been um, we have tried to uh, uh, get ahead of um, the opioid epidemic, after initially falling uh, behind very early on, we uh, our our providers are the uh, are the have the lowest rate of new prescribing of of opioid medications in the state. We thought that was going to be the fix early on, um, but all it did was allow for um, uh, you know cheap heroin uh, to become an option, and overdoses continuing to rise. We developed. Um, uh, ED and uh, in, in initiation, emergency room initiation for MAT, working with our first responders who who go to overdoses in uh, area homes and bring people in to say, hey, we can start your care now. We work very closely with our uh, hub and spoke providers. We're a Narcan distribution site. We brought in recovery coaches uh, 247 in our emergency room. Um, and despite all of those efforts before the pandemic, we um, uh, have been continuing to deal with um, 
uh, a rising uh, overdose death rate in, in Windsor County. Um, those it does seem to have leveled off and we do expect that will decline. Uh, but this has been um, a challenge that every time we think we've got it right, we're gonna make a difference, something else pops up and um, uh, we have to uh, change our strategy again. And I, I just think that will continue. The other community impact has been behavioral health needs beyond substance use disorder, loss of jobs, financial stress, isolation, remote learning, loss of socialization for children. Um, our pediatrics clinics, um, have an immense amount of behavioral health resources embedded in their clinic and they're still overwhelmed as everyone wore masks no one came in with viral illnesses anymore but behavioral health, health crises have become the norm i think in all of our pediatric clinics um and we've we've uh like everyone else again you've heard it you've heard from this year a in marked increase in volume of patients with behavioral health crises um waiting in our in our inpatient beds um uh, you can see you know our impact on on financials we uh, as i said we made some choices very early on in the pandemic to bring covid patients here and to care for covid patients in the acute unit the rehab unit and in our swing in our swing space and we were the only people uh, doing that for a while i think most of our other surrounding hospitals uh, over time got the structure in place that they needed to and that has started to um, uh, dip ag uh, again and then again a, a somewhat uh, recent uptick once more with with the recent surges but um, that that uh, really was a, a shot in the arm during the pandemic um, especially early on and I, I won't spend too much time in here it's it's just what our what our volumes had done um, uh, pre-COVID to current And Dave, I don't know if you have any comment on these. I'd pretty. Uh, yeah, I think you know they're they're pretty self-explanatory, and I, I I thought I would provide it because it's interesting. Uh, some lines of business were were more affected than others, and uh, like the slide you have up here is, you know, we lost a lot of the swing bed referrals that we would get from primarily Dartmouth, but some other facilities as well. Uh, uh, elective knee surgeries and hip surgeries, uh, and they would come here and get three, four days of rehab and 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 be sent home. Uh, those were all off the table uh, during COVID, and then you look at other things like acute you know, we, we, we did fine and, and uh, rehab, we had a couple dips uh, during the course of the year, um, but uh, um, you know, overall pretty close to, to what had been budgeted. Um, and then uh, maybe uh, I think, let's see. So you can see emergency room, that trend has continued. Um, and then the operating room, we took a big dip, but with the accommodations and some creativity with staff and docs, uh, we were able to get that back to where was it, where it was expected. And just as some perspective, we kind of estimated uh, the more urgent or emergent uh, the and less elective the service was uh, for FY21, uh, the more likely we were to hit the budget mark. And um, and for those uh, that were contrary to that, you know, the opposite. So, you know, when we look at, at kind of year to date financials, um, we we nailed most of those. I think what the one thing we didn't expect uh, was that swing would go down that low, uh, but we were bailed out with the uh, number of acute patients that we took on the unit. And then um, uh, just go down two slides, Joe because they can, they're, they're good readers. Um, payer mix, um, this was kind of interesting, I, I thought. Uh, so Medicare before, during, and, and to current, you can't even tell there's two lines there. Um, and then Medicaid kind of bounced around and we, we had a, a dip, but then we had a little gain in FY21 uh, quarter three that kind of offset the dip. So we're kind of as a whole pretty even on that. And the story on Medic uh, on commercial and Blue Cross is that they basically, uh, Blue Cross went down as a percentage of our business, but commercial went up. So they kind of offset each other. And then this is a slide, uh, um, um, just some of the funding that we received uh, related to COVID and uh, the bottom two showing the current reserve that we're carrying on the books uh, for returning that money. 
and then one this is just expenses again we didn't furlough anybody uh, and uh, you know we tried to uh, keep things as flat and predictable as possible for staff um, as well as the providers and I, I think you can see here from labor and non-labor we we kept that pretty tight great um, uh, so I'll, uh, I'll I'll finish us uh, up here uh, so we've included our responses to the healthcare advocate questions. So first one, how much funding in your current future budgets has been allocated to DEI work in or racial equity focused projects, trainings, or collaborations? Um, so we we have uh, current, we, as I mentioned earlier, we've got about uh, 1.2 or so million dollars in community health grant funding. Um, that we actively pursue every year to fund efforts uh, that that under the umbrella fall our uh, our DEI work. Um, we just did a community assessment education program for our BIPOC and L LGBTQ plus uh, populations. We're waiting on analysis of that survey, and that'll guide some specifically guide some of our outreach work. We have a very active um, prevention group, the Montescott Need Prevention Partnership, otherwise known as MAP. Um, that has funding in all three of its major prevention grants, and this is well over half a million dollars uh, in, in funding, but it's around tobacco. It's around, uh, let me get my, make sure I get my acronyms right. Um, uh, the uh, uh, prevention uh, grant e uh, expansion, which is PEG, the PCE grant, which has made uh, our region a, a prevention uh, center of excellence um and the prevention network grant uh we all have we have money set aside for dei work there they're part of a larger overall budget it's difficult to get um uh the uh numbers down to the dollar um but our our the, the folks that are doing this work are estimating the 20 percent of the grant cover this work so it's between 100 and 120 thousand um, dollars uh for for those efforts um in the past year, MAP has also provided LGBTQ plus training to community partners. We'll offer this, uh, again, offer this grant um, to early childhood providers. Uh, they sponsored a docu-series for a community audience uh, around LGBTQ plus uh, issues. Um, and we uh, in our sponsored a, a, a 5K uh, uh, with health, health disparity uh, disparities messages um, all along the route, which I think was really well received by our community. Um, we've uh, drafted a needs and disparities statement compiling uh, health disparities data and also updated it for, for 21, and we'd be happy to share that uh, with either the uh, healthcare advocate or the GMCB. Um, we, uh, much of our work around substance use and, and, and misuse uh, is spent addressing some of the health disparity issues. Um, we utilize our health disparities reports, such as the YRBS data brief. So that's the youth risk behavior uh, survey, um, uh, the Windsor County profile, et cetera, to understand how we can direct resources and in, in interventions toward underserved and high risk populations. Of, as a reminder, YRBS uh, really tells us what the, uh, has our, allows us to get our finger on the pulse of what's happening in our schools. Uh, the, the PCE grant dashboard tracks disparities uh, uh, between the general middle school and high school populations uh, and LGBTQ students and students of color and our uh, center of excellence work looks to reduce those disparities for, for both risk and then protective factors. Uh, what percentage of staff and administration administrative leadership have received training in language access needs, implicit bias and cultural competency? So every Mount of Scotney employee every year undergoes annual compliance training around cultural compliancy through our ULEARN modules. Uh, we made a, an operational goal uh, for our hospital in 21 and 22 to increase the amount of trauma-informed staff members we have uh, at the hospital and in our clinics. And we've set up a process to review all our current policies in our policy library uh, to make sure that they uh, 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 reflect sensitivity toward trauma-informed care and DEI issues at Montescutney. Um, I wanted to pull out a specific example where we've had some um, success uh, in some of the DEI work uh, in our rehab services department, which is our acute rehab and our outpatient um, uh, rehab services. Uh, they've focused on LGBTQ 
uh, issues. We revise screening tools for all patients coming into our rehab services department uh, uh, to identify folks. Uh, we all 60 individuals in the rehab services department participated in this, and that includes PT, OT, care management, nursing staff, all of our uh, P, all our uh, rehab aides um, as well. And we've also welcomed international traveling nurses onto our units, and with that have developed some uh, specific cultural competency education, kind of a curriculum around the home home regions of where these nurses are coming from to prep our staff and to um, uh, get them ready to to accept nurses from the Philippines and from Nigeria. Um, and uh, it, it's it's been uh, wonderfully successful, uh, I would say. Uh, questions around uh, languages. Uh, I would say that this was a, a wonderful question and triggered a lot of investigation on, on our side. For our HCAP surveys, which is our inpatient patient satisfaction, that was the data I shared or, uh, very early in the presentation. Languages available are Spanish, Chinese, traditional Portuguese, Brazilian, Russian, Vietnamese. Our outpatient uh, CAPs uh, is Spanish, Chinese, traditional Russian. Race and ethnicity are also an available data field in these surveys. We've also, for our own workforce, have collected um, that data through our uh, engagement with an outside consultant, a healthy workforce initiative, our community health needs assessment, and uh, the, D the Dartmouth Hitchcock Health system-wide employee engagement survey. Um, all that said, I think we look better on the slide than we do in real life. Um, the, the ability to get the appropriate language surveys depends entirely on the, da the, the data feed that we provide to Press Ganey, um, who performs these surveys on, on our behalf. So if we don't check the correct boxes internally, and that's an ongoing EMR project for us, then folks aren't getting the right language. So that's been through this question, we've identified that as a quality improvement project um, so that we can uh, make sure that uh, our patients are, are getting the right surveys from a language perspective. Um, the last question, was any changes around bad debt and free care during the pandemic? And um, we really haven't, haven't seen all that much. And Dave, I'm not sure if you wanted to add anything to that. Yeah, there's ebbs and flows. Uh, it's it's the the changes are fairly uh, immaterial. Um, you know, I think generally the fluctuation is, you know, ten to twenty basis points uh, a year, plus or minus. Um, the one thing that uh, my staff uh, identified is that they've seen a lot uh, uh, a lot more applications from younger applicants out of work uh, during the last year and a half. Um, but what we we really try to be creative here. Um, where most of my revenue cycle folks are working uh, remotely and have been. Um, uh, we, for our financial counselors, um, have rotated them through. So they, uh, uh, they do some time here on campus. Uh, we took over the gift shop and the lobby uh, to make it easy and people wouldn't have to navigate through the whole facility over, uh, over this pandemic and, and be easier to follow the safety measures. Um, so we've uh, we've been able to have pretty good access. Uh, Zoom and some of those uh, features have also helped in 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 talking about some maybe more complicated financial situations. Uh, but by and large, uh, there hasn't been a big change either way. And uh, what we've budgeted for 22 is is commensurate with what we've historically budgeted. Somewhere, you know, around 2.75 uh, percent between bad debt and free care and the same proportion between the two. And um, that's it. Thank you for uh, <clears throat> listening. That was uh, quite a rundown. This is a pick from our emergency room. Um, uh, this must have been a quieter time. As I said, we hit a mark of 41 visits in a day in the last two weeks and uh, in a seven or eight bed uh, ED that is uh, that is hopping and not not sustainable. Uh, hopefully we can return to some more normalish uh, volumes over the rest of the summer and, and fall. So uh, with that, we'll we'll open for questions. Thank you for for listening. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I can't hear Mr. Mullen. I think you're muted. 
I am. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Kim. Um, thank you so much, uh, uh, Team Monoscutney. And we're going to start our board questions with board member lunch, Robin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, as always, for a very complete presentation and very clear submission. Um, appreciate it. Uh, I wanted to actually start where you ended, Joe, around the ED utilization. And I was just curious, you had mentioned, obviously, uh, behavioral health, which is certainly something we've been hearing um, with other hospitals around the state, as well as um, sometimes ED utilization being up from deferred care and higher acuity. I, I was wondering if what the what your kind of thinking is behind those numbers. Yeah. Um... I've been trying to figure that out. Um, I, I do think that there was some um, pandemic word on the street around where you were, if you showed up, where you would be admitted. Um, and uh, again, I, I think early on, we just said, yep, yeah, we'll, we'll take everyone, just send them, we'll figure it out. Um, uh, again, I think that was based on years of other, other work to, to, to be able to do that and other and again I want to uh, neighboring hospitals did get to the point where they could keep folks in their ED although there are still some within the health system that <laughs> do not so we, we we take them too um which is fine uh you know I, I think we all saw lab utilization and radiology utilization through the roof across the state um and I know otherwise uh, you know I, I know what is happening regionally um uh, with our surrounding hospitals and where where ED volumes uh, are, most have recovered pretty close at this point. Um, and I'm not sure if patterns that were established early in the pandemic have just continued. Um, and uh, even though other uh, facilities capacity has ha have increased, people are just now following where they've what where they've got gone over the last 18 months. We still see uh, significant pressure um, from the New Hampshire side um, as well. That that um, that flow of patients across uh, the river uh, is still occurring. And I'll say the other our other system partner in New Hampshire is Cheshire Medical Center in Keene. They have been at significant capacity um, mm -hmm. uh, for for a couple months. So we are we are getting numbers of patients from the Keene area. Basically everything between Keene and if they if they don't just go over to Brattleboro, they're they're coming up 91 um, uh, to us. And the, you know our transfer center does try to the 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 regional Dartmouth Hitchcock transfer center does try to um, you know if Cheshire calls with a patient they can't man, they can't keep because of capacity, they'll say okay and they'll bring the Escutney person online to say you know where are you guys what's your capacity and um, so we've become a little bit better at moving folks across the system. And I think I think this may be a contradiction, but new histor historical referral patterns by self-referral patterns in patients have occurred. Um, our ED volumes also reflect a loss of primary care access, um, mm. especially in the last six weeks or so. We've had two providers leave our Woodstock clinic, both for valid family reasons. Um, and that has reduced capacity, so those folks show up in our ED. We don't have an urgent care option at Monoscutney right now, but we are trying to frantically set one up on the fly um, uh, so that you know patients that do have ambulatory sensitive conditions get ambulatory sensitive care and not show up in our ED. Um, we're trying to do this in a 30-day timeline to go from zero to urgent care or fast track at least. Um, so if we can pull that off, that will help um, reduce ED volume, reduce cost, which is a, a, a big issue. Well, thank you. That's helpful to kind of understand the context. I appreciate it. Um, and Dave, I just wanted to follow up on the blueprint uncertainty. So I'm assuming you are talking about the uh, blueprint indicating that they're going to work on changing their payment methodology. I just heard last week on the executive committee meeting that that won't happen until 2023. Um, so I wanted to mention that and see if that's what you were referring to or if there's something else going on the blueprint that we haven't heard about. 
Um, so, yeah, we're aware of that as well, uh, although I don't think we had a timeline um, for that. Uh, but also uh, when we received uh, some accounting for our current year um, ACO report uh, the end of last month, um, it was interesting that the blueprint funding from Medicare, because Medicare stopped funding that, uh, has now been rolled into our Medicare risk number. Um, so, you know, that was the first time we've kind of heard that that might be coming. Um, so that's here. So now that's kind of a, it's kind of a risk issue regardless of budgeted it, but there's like a little asterisk next to it that uh, we're not sure how certain that is. Yeah, and, and I, if I could add just to that, um, I mean, sure. as, as you all know, I'm, I'm vice chair of the board of managers at One Care as a DH appointee, so conflict of interest hats are, are on all the time. Um, uh, you know, we as we've in One Care as we've responded to hospitals saying we got to, you know, be nice to reduce our uh, our downside risk, our risk corridors. You know, we have certainly lim we while we limit our downside risk, we also limit our our potential shared savings, and we all know that we fund the blueprint from you know advanced shared savings dollars. So um, we're we're we have to be cognizant that as we lower risk corridors, which we're asking for, we're also reducing our ability to really get shared savings. Have we created just a break even um, ACO, which um, you know, it's not the biggest incentive to get to, to grow our network. If like, well, we're, you're not, there's not much downside and there's virtually no upside because of how we fund blueprint. I think it raises the bigger issue of how a program, which has been immensely valuable to all of our practices, um, gets funded moving forward. Thank you. Yep. Um, and then my last question was in your narrative, um, you talked about when you were talking, uh, this is on page two, when you're talking about the utilizations, you mentioned that you also recently implemented provider productivity initiatives. Could you talk a little bit about that? Um, actually, I, I don't I don't have that in front of me, but I, we have not um, instituted provider productivity. We measure that and we've been measuring it for many years. In fact, um, uh, I just presented uh, the year to date uh, numbers to our finance committee last month. So this is something that we look at uh, from a senior management perspective, uh, and we do it as part of our, our budget process and planning process, and we report back to our finance committee and therefore the board kind of how things are going. And much of uh, uh, what Joe touched on already, you know, where podiatry has become a regional practice. So their pro you know, his productivity has radically changed uh, because he says yes uh, to, to patient need. Um, and then we have uh, losses of primary care, but we just try to look to see, you know, the uh, uh, visits per FTE, very simple measures just to see how a given practice is, is changing or staying the same over time. We, uh, Robin, we we have yeah. a we have a, a single um, provider, uh, surgical specialty provider who does have an RVU incentive. Um, that's a and our entire medical staff. Um, our that's primary, what I remembered. <laughs> yeah, our primary <laughs> our primary care pediatrics, all other providers, surgeons are have a straight salary. Um, but as Dave said, we kind of like to know the context um, sure. uh, as we build compensation models. Um, you, you know, you want to try to match comp with 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 productivity with some guardrails. Um, but no, it, and, and th th it's a great example of that threading the needle I mentioned with yeah. DH and us. Um, all the other system members are, uh, if they're not already there, are moving toward RVU based incentive comp. Uh, for their providers, and you know, I've I've been a proponent of uh, the ACO and population health, and I feel like I'm be talking out of both sides of my mouth if I say we're focusing on population health, getting to a point where maybe we have global budgets or effective uh, uh, prospective payments, regardless of how many times you see a patient. Oh, and by the way, you know, see as many as you can so you can get your RBU bonus. I mean, that's. We we moved away from that years ago, and I, no yeah. plans to go back right now. But again, it is an example of that needle threading. Could could we get a mandate? It 
certainly, um, but we've been able to artfully dodge it so far. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you for that clarification. That's that having yeah. remembered that from prior years, it's yeah. quite frankly why it caught my eye in your narrative. Um, OK, that's my questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Robin. Next, we'll turn to board member Pelham. Tom. Well, thank you both Joe and Dave for a very thorough uh, presentation. It's clear to me that you are well grounded not only in your, your facility and institution, but in also the dynamics of your region. And uh, so it's a very helpful presentation. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, one is on the provider tax. Uh, you are carrying uh, in your 2022 budget um, $1.87 million, which is only 3.1% of the $60.5 uh, million in 2021 projected NPR and FPP. Um, and so I think you you have the lowest percentage across all, all hospitals. Most of them that this year have are within a few decimal points of, of 6% of their um, 2021 projected um, NPR FPP. And I'm, so I'm wondering if there's a an answer to that question. Um, well, I'd like to say that I'm smart enough to beat the system, but that hasn't happened. Um, <laughs> what has happened is that we have a, a very high percentage of swing bed uh, business as well as um, fairly robust clinic line of business as a percentage of total business. And those two areas fall outside of the provider tax calculation. So it's really inpatient rehab, inpatient acute, and uh, the outpatient acute uh, services. So we, we've we've historically been in similar positions, um, and and swing bed is is a very large carve out as is the physician practices. I think you guys will recall that um, when the, the physicians uh, on Southwestern's campus became Dartmouth uh, providers, the uh, provider tax went down significantly for them. At, they're off the radar screen, so it's sim similar here. So the uh, the the 3.1% plus or minus number is within your traditional ballpark. Yes. There you go. Um, thank you for that. Um, I have a question on the uh, uh, COVID advances. Um, I note that um, in the appendix seven, you're carrying um, at the end of September, September 30th, 2022, um, $3.2 million uh, in, um, I think that was in, in CARES Act, and another $2.7 million for a total of 5.9, but a $2.7 million in um, a Medicare Advance. And I'm just wondering, so that's at the end, September 30th, 2022. Um, how do you expect that to unfold? Um, you're starting to pay back the Medicare advance, as I think I recall, at like $500,000 a month. Um, so where do you truly expect to be um, in September 30th, uh, 2022? And uh, do you think some of that CARES Act money will end up being uh, 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 accounted for as revenue as opposed to the liability that profiles in, in Appendix 7? So uh, you, you're, you're exactly right. We are paying back uh, 500,000, give or take, a month and have been since the uh, Medicare advanced uh, payments have uh, been scheduled to be returned. And so we actually, when we looked at that schedule, we played with that a little bit. It's like, well, we really should put the number that it's going to be on September 30th as opposed to anything else. So uh, we expect to be paid down to 3.2 million uh, by September 30th. Relative to the PRF uh, uh, funding, um, we we built that reserve of 2.7 last year, last year. and uh, we're trying to figure out um, how that's going to change, uh, if at all, uh, from our current position because that that's a that's a huge risk for us. Uh, we bounced back and recovered so well. Um, that all of a sudden a lot of that funding, the necessity for that funding went away. So um, our last calculation falls within the same 
uh, parameter, but they've changed those that interpretation at least nine times that I'm aware of. So every time we get a new release, uh, Teresa and I go back and we do the math and see if that reserve has changed. And we talked to our accounting firm uh, probably a, a month and a half ago, I would say, and there's just no compelling reason to reserve more at this point, and there's no compelling reason to uh, loosen the belt on that either. So uh, at this point, we expect to owe that 2.7. Mm -hmm. So um, on the Medicare Advance, so at some point in prior to September 30th, 2022, you will have, uh, they will have recaptured uh, what, what they're scheduled to recapture. Um, and then the Medicare payments after that then will be uh, increased because you don't have the $500,000 hit every month. Um, so are, is, are the numbers that we see in the uh, payer mix account for account for that, that at some point in time in 2022, uh, that $500,000 uh, payment go, or re recapture amount goes away? No, because we have reserves, so all we'll do is eat away at the reserve. It won't affect our, our numbers going forward. Okay. Um, my next one is having to do with, let me just make sure here, um, just a quick one. So I'm looking at uh, uh, the FPPs, and I go back to uh, 2019 actual uh, in terms of FPPs as a portion of, of NPR FPP. And the, the, the dollar amount has dropped from 6.4 million in 2019 actual down to your 2022 budget at 1.7 uh, million around it. And that's all Medicaid according to Appendix 6. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, at some point, does the, you know, the um, kind of administrative effort to take care of a smaller and smaller number just not make sense? Um, so, yeah, so this will be a great answer. Um, uh, buckle up. So uh, the, the, the Medicaid um, uh, FPP actually works fairly well for us. Um, the accounting is clean. Uh, the uh, reporting, there's a lag on the data as, as would be expected, but generally uh, that, that's pretty clean on our books. It's pretty clean as reported by uh, One Care Vermont. So uh, we don't have any compelling reason to, uh, to get out of that. Um, we've had some migration from other service areas um, to ours. Um, and so uh, that's all been recognized by One Care Vermont uh, through their normal process. So I, I'm not I'm not messing with it. I'm just leaving it uh, on the Medicare side. Um, we jumped out uh, of the FPP, but still participate in risk um, because that was a, a completely different story. Okay. Um, and now I'm looking at the payer mix, and I'm looking at at, at your Medicaid amounts. And uh, for um, you have a trend going back to 2019 of Medicaid growth at uh, 41%. It's it's quite a hefty growth rate, uh, at least on the payer mix presentation. But you but uh, so you have it at in in 2021 budget. It's at 3.46 million Medicaid. 2021 projected at 3.34 million Medicaid. And then in 2022B, it jumps up 53% to $5.12 million. And I'm just wondering what that bump is. Yeah, actually, uh, that that's an error on our part. Um, we understated Medicare a bit and overstated Medicaid. And because the numbers associated with Medicare are so large uh, as compared to Medicaid, it skewed that. Um, part of the issue, and I know you guys have heard this in a couple of things, we don't always slice our data the way that you guys would like. And uh, and so when we uh, try to take out of our model and assimilate that to adaptive and the reporting standards, and we did we did make a, a mistake there, and, and we can work with Lori or whoever to correct that if that would be helpful. But if you look at our total uh, percent of charges that we would realize through net patient service revenue. It's pretty consistent with history and there's no changes, material changes with our commercial or Blue Cross business. Um, 
but there was uh, uh, some money in Medicare that dropped to the Medicaid bucket when we sliced and diced, and I apologize for that. Okay, and um, let me see. That's all for me. Thank you very, very much. That was helpful. I'm sorry, Kevin, you're, you're muted. Kevin. Kevin, you're muted. Thanks, Tom. Um, next, we're gonna turn to board member Yusufer Maureen. Uh, first, thank you for your presentation. Um, a couple questions. When we look at your NPR projections from um, the 2021 projection to the 22 budget, um, you're the only hospital that's showing a decline. All the other hospitals are showing, you know, some type of increase year over year. And, you know, just wanted to talk about, I know you've talked some about the swing beds and things like that, but, you know, are there any changes in your projection for 21? And, and when you end this year, you know, do we think we really will be below where we end this year for 20, when we net out in 22? I, I apologize. I missed the beginning of your question. I had uh, my great granddaughter was born this morning and oh, wow. I'm on the side managing uh, COVID testing uh, so that my granddaughter can go home and not come to my house. So I apologize. I missed the beginning of that as I was responding to it's the just, local just Vermont where hospital for testing. The NPR for 21 projection to your 22 budget is showing a decline. And that's the lowest of all the hospitals um, and the only one showing a decline, you know, an expectation that we're going to be lower next year than where we really end up this year. And just wanted to to address um, address that. And I know you've talked about swing beds and things like that, but is that realistic to assume you'll be lower next year than where you end up this year? Yeah, I guess uh, we we took we backed off a, a couple percentage points. Um, not knowing whether the volumes uh, that we've had over the last year plus uh, that have come from other service areas or have uh, come from within the system that didn't go to other system hospitals, that that would be sustained. And so, uh, uh, and we also uh, figured out that we would uh, take a hit with sequestering as well that we talked about earlier. Maureen, I'll, I'll add, um, I mean, you've seen our, our data for 21. I mean, it's kind of a remarkable year for the organization. Um, um, and I, I'm I'm always thinking about when the wave's going to crash, but in uh, preparing for, for what's next, uh, knowing how tenuous uh, small hospital finance is and performance, um, I, I don't I'm not sure this this year is uh, reproducible um, since budget presentation a budget submission to our presentation today. You know, we've lost a, a couple docs. Um, uh, actually, I take, we've lost four docs, including our outpatient physiatrist who's going to the VA, two primary care docs, um, and th those have huge implications. So you'd think, you know, what is physiatry? Uh, what is that loss? And, and we're not going to let that program die because we have an acute rehab, but you know, that that provider does. Uh, EMGs, uh, electromyelographic studies, which are reimbursed at a very high level. Um, so we 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 we're losing that. Um, so it just doesn't take much uh, to push us over. I, and I think if uh, just knowing our our trends, uh, submitting a budget that looked just like that that really looked just like this year's performance in 21 would have been. Um, I, I don't think I could have stomached that, and I don't think Dave could either. Uh, knowing what, know, knowing what changes are are on the horizon, potential gain or loss of services, um, it, it's uh, um, I, maybe I would have been more optimistic. Um, but I don't. One fantastic year um, is not really moving us off our historical strengths around expense management, appropriate service lines. You know, not building out boutique services. We just We've got to we've got to stay on the on the roadmap here. I think the other uh, uh, part of that is that um, as our volume has grown greater than expected, our cost per unit has gone down on our cost report, and uh, and it's really 
you know, the beginning of the year, we weren't too crazy, but now it's it's really gotten crazy over the last three or four months as far as positive. And uh, that is going to drop our Medicare uh, reimbursement down. Uh, so our cost per unit will go down. Um, and so we factored that in, although again, this was, this data, you know, was submitted a few months ago. And uh, since then we've we've gotten even busier. So we don't even have a projection for that, and we won't until we close the month of August and run an interim cost report. Okay, thanks. Um, can you talk a little bit about the 2.7 million you still have on the balance sheet for COVID funding and that you, you may be able to um, recoup um, and what the, what the status of that is? So not the repayments for- Right, uh, the 2.7 is, is the- uh, um, uh, the provider relief funding, and uh, we received over five million dollars in funding according to the HHS calculation. And uh, when we accounted for it at year end last year, September 30th, uh, when we calculated out what we would be allowed to retain, uh, we determined that uh, 2.7 million dollars would need to be returned as of uh, the close of last fiscal year. Um, one of the issues with that, to be frank, is that uh, we actually could swing either way. We could keep a majority of that 2.7 million and pick up a $2.7 million gain, or we could actually have to pay that back and more. The reason is that the uh, standardized reporting for PRF uh, is this, this, I want to get into all the details, but um, there are a number of ways, uh, options that they give you to measure that. And if we use a, a standard change of net patient service revenue between the two years, um, 19 and 20, um, we actually look entirely unfavorable and would have to return the money, uh, most of it. Uh, except for the COVID direct expense. The problem is uh, in 19, because of our uh, Medicare um, FPP relationship with One Care Vermont, it resulted in CMS not ac accurately reporting our net reimbursement. So we have to use atypical reporting to HHS to justify the retention of those funds. Now, Teresa and I understand that reporting, and we understand uh, that it's a completely legitimate measure that gets us to only a $2.7 million return. Um, I have zero faith that, uh, that the federal government will understand that atypical reporting, which, by the way, is allowed under the current interpretation, but it's to be reviewed and may or may not be accepted. So really, we could end up with uh, a, a very large gain in a future period, or uh, we could actually have uh, the uh, 2.4 million that we did recognize taken away from us if that uh, non-standard reporting methodology is not accepted by HHS or whoever ultimately audits this. And when will that be resolved, do you think? Uh, sometime next year. Okay. Um, and then in your commentary, you talked about um, right sizing and rationalizing and reducing some pricing, particularly for um, CT and MRI. I think you went down like minus 21 and 20 percent um, and also talked about other potential areas where you're looking at to do that. And, you know, can you talk about what areas those are, what implications they might be? And um, I applaud you for right sizing, you know, these pricing. Yeah, we'd actually uh, been wanting to do it um, when 19 went well. We decided we were going to start chipping away at that. And then uh, 20, our budget got cut. So we decided not to take the risk. And then we slid right into COVID during 20. So there was so much uncertainty. Uh, we were underfunded with the Medicare advance payments by approximately 100%. Um, so we said, OK, we're, screw it. We're not touching it. Um, in 20. But then as we rolled through recovery and then into 21 and things were going well, we said, okay, we've got to put this back on the table. So uh, we did do CT. We have done MRI. 
uh, to very high ticket services. Um, we have done a laboratory and I have done the calculation for outpatient therapy as well as um, other diagnostic imaging, ultrasound, uh, X-ray, uh, and uh, bone density, and, and, and mammogram, and, and some of those. So um, we estimate that it's probably about $1.8 million in gross charges uh, coming off uh, the books. And that started a couple months ago, and we've been, uh, as, as I put them into place and they've rolled through the system, uh, we've sent uh, uh, notes to Patrick and to Lori uh, advising them of that change. Um, and uh, not all of those are incorporated in the budget as I referenced earlier. Okay, great. And just to comment on, you know, when, and I know you did answer the um, healthcare advocates question about, you know, your pricing index to Medicare. Um, you know, one of the things I've been looking at is looking at all the hospitals and their submissions and just doing kind of the gross to net calculation um, and then comparing that to uh, Medicare, to uh, commercial and Medicaid. And so far, you're the lowest. So that's good. That's a good number. <laughs> you're, you index 1.2 to um, your Medicare rate. So it helps us at least from a benchmark. I know it's not completely apples to apples across, you know, all services, all hospitals, but yeah. but at some point you have all your services that you're doing, and you know you have that reconciliation, and so um, you know it does help to look at that as one benchmark. So thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. And I'm all set. Thanks. Thank you, Maureen. Next, we'll turn to Board Member Holmes, Jessica. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to echo a lot of thanks, actually, for I think what was a really impressive and thorough presentation. I, I want to say that I appreciate all that you've been doing with the pandemic, but also your efforts in the areas of improving costs, quality access, and actually all the efforts you're doing for reducing health disparities. I think it's incredibly, uh, you're, you're like a model for the state in many ways, so I want to acknowledge that. Um, one area that I would, you know, as you were talking, Joe, about, um, you know, some of this NPR growth that potentially is, is well, some of this growth that's coming from other areas, uh, New Hampshire in particular, and some of this engagement you have with Valley Regional. I'm wondering if you're able to track some of that growth in NPR separately. Um, and the reason I, I think about this, and I think I've mentioned this in years past, but I wish we as a board could track that better. We limit NPR growth, right? But I've always been personally open to the idea of setting aside growth in NPR that comes from out of state. I view that more as medical tourism, right, that promotes job growth in our state and doesn't count against us in, in you know, areas with the all-payer model. Uh, so I'm wondering if you have a way to track in-state, out-of-state traffic and, you know, particularly as you're engaging more, uh, you know, in New Hampshire going forward. Honestly, I wouldn't want that growth to be held against you <laughs> as we're as we're looking forward. Yeah. Well, we can agree on that, Jessica, so thank you for that. Uh, we would like it not held against us as well. Um, what I can tell you is, so um, we can absolutely determine the percentage um, of, of, of net revenue growth um, for out-of-state business um, and by line of business, so inpatient versus outpatient. Last year, uh, or going from 20 to 21, uh, our outpatient percentage of business went up four and a half percent. So what was 100 last year is now 104.5 this year. Um, it's a little bit skewed um, during pa the pandemic because we were accepting patients from Bay State and Massachusetts, New York, Connecticut, um, you know, uh, very, uh, very sick patients coming up and, and staying within our rehab department. Um, so uh, it was a little bit bigger than we would have normally banked on, but about 28% of our business comes from across the river. And uh, I would be happy to provide some supplemental schedule if, if, if that would help out. I think we did one for you in 20, so we could probably uh, use that same format if that was helpful and and provide that to you. But we are we are definitely um, you know seeing a fair amount of patients and it grew four and a half percent from the prior year. Yeah, I just think in in general, you know, our border hospitals, it would be helpful for all of them to track this this yeah. flow of patients and in particular uh, going forward. But you know, 
as you mentioned, you're engaging more in these collaborative relationships. So it's going to only be, you know, I mean, I recognize the pandemic is a unique year, but I suspect Mount Escutney is going to have this traffic, you know, increasing over time. So helpful either in the short run or next year's budget submission to help us understand some of that in state out of state would be really helpful. Um, I also just want to acknowledge and thank you for initiating, you know, your own pricing reductions, you know, particularly in the areas of imaging and to continue to look at that. I would say, you know, in my time at the board, it's, it's happened, but it doesn't happen all that frequently. So it should be acknowledged when it does. Uh, Dave, in your presentation today, you mentioned that the change in charge will actually now really be effectively be 0% when you factor in those changes that you've already made. So I'm actually asking you, would you like to amend your request to that effect? I feel like you should be getting credit for that fiscal responsibility and the efforts that you're making to make healthcare more affordable for your community. If it's really going to be zero when you factor that in, do you want to actually amend the request? So we, we've talked about it. So again, thank you. I entirely agree with you. And we've, we've talked uh, about this more than once. And, uh, you know, We've run some uh, some studies on it and tried to figure out what we think uh, is absorbable, you know, um, to some degree, um, reducing a charge for a CT for a Medicaid patient. Who cares? It, it doesn't mean anything because, uh, um, you know, we don't get paid well for it. Um, and so we've tried to, to figure it out as best we can. Um, we do, we, as, as Joe said, we thread the needle all the time here. So we're competing with New Hampshire business, right? Uh, we're, we're subject to Dartmouth's expectations for margin and, and whatnot. Um, we've got One Care Vermont to deal with. Um, we've got our own board of trustees and their expectations. And so what I think we've done is we've threaded the needle um, because one of the problems we have is that you guys have a MPSR a FPP growth cap. So we've tried to come as close as we can to all of our competing priorities and you know satisfying them at a reasonable level. So I appreciate the offer. Um, I, I'm I'm willing to roll the dice with the work we've done, um, as long as I'm getting credit for doing the right thing. Um, I I doubt very much that our math was off enough that I will be concerned at any point next year, um, but. Um, if we are, I guess we can talk about that. But uh, I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking we've threaded the needle, and we're gonna we're gonna see how it goes. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna give you more credit. Actually, I'm just giving out credit today. Lots of credit. <laughs> you are. Uh, I'm gonna thank you for completing the HCA table. You know where you compared the commercial to Medicare ratio, um, and not everybody complied with that request. And so again, I want to thank you for that. I appreciate that you did and took the time to do it. So. Um, more credit where credit is due. Uh, I wanted to ask you about in your in the narrative, um, there was a discussion about the shift that you're seeing to Medicare Part C or Medicare Advantage. Um, and in particular, you say Medicare Advantage generally do not have Medicare like reimbursement rates require higher admin operation costs and do not settle on costs. And I'm wondering if you can elaborate as we are seeing this shift to MA. What is that going to do to the cost shift? Is it going to mean that commercially insured are going to have to pay even more if we see more Medicare Advantage plans not reimbursing with traditional Medicare fee for service? Administrative costs going up. Can you talk about this? Because this is something new to me. So, yeah, so this is, you know, it was kind of like a, a minor irritation a few years ago, um, but our percentage of, of Medicare Part C, it grows literally every year and uh, companies that we had no footprint in this area, UHC in particular, United Healthcare, um, you know, was just very, very small. Um, now it's it's actually becoming substantial. So you, you've hit the three points and, and one of them is that they don't settle on cost. So Medicare gives us a prospective payment, whether it's inpatient, outpatient, and and at the end of the year we kind of settle up. You know, well we saw more of your patients, and it was they were more expensive, high acuity patients, and you know we settle up on costs, and they write us a check or we write them a check. Um, Part C, uh, they they don't settle, and so the other problem is that when um, uh, they don't, when Medicare changes our prospective rate, 
um, we send that to um, these Medicare Part C. Most of our contracts are some derivative off of Medicare. So, you know, 1.01, you know, something. And so when we get those updates, when we file our cost report, uh, they have 60 days and and I mean, with, we're all adults here, right? So costs go up. Um, so generally speaking, um, you know, our, our costs go up and Medicare rates go up every year, but there's a delay on that and there's no settlement on costs. So there are month, periods of time, depending on the payer and when I get updated rates from Medicare, uh, that I can go three to nine <laughs> months uh, without that bump up from Part C. Um, and uh, and then the overhead, the administrative overhead, Medicare, we just take care of our Medicare patients if they're traditional Medicare patients. Uh, there's not Medicare authorizations and pre-certifications and, and, and all of that nonsense. We just follow their, their uh, utilization review standards and stick to them and everything goes well for everybody. Um, but with uh, the Part C, they they have uh, pre certs pre auths concurrent review, where we check in on patients on a daily or every other day basis. Um, they get really nitpicky, and we do have to throw some money and some bodies at that. Um, I'm currently uh, in the process of collecting a hundred and ten thousand dollar rehab stay. Uh, from one of those payers um, because uh, they say we didn't uh, complete the concurrent review, which we have all the notes and we have all the documentation, but now we've got to go through a formal appeal process to get the 110,000 they already owe us. Um, so, you know, this is, does it, does it save Medicare money? Yeah, it probably does. Uh, is it killing us? No, administratively it kind of is starting to. Yeah, we've I've heard uh, data nationally that you know, up to 30% of referrals for uh, specialty imaging inpatient stays are denied by uh, MA plans. And you know, again, my AHA work, uh, we are trying to we are focusing on the um, uh, uh, moving uh, MA toward at least consideration of of um, some cost based reconciliation that that comes up with from every CAH uh, across the country. But just the overall denial ethos of the MA plans is is a killer. And yeah, I mean, as Dave said, you know, that's one case. We've got a number of them in the books with UHC and Cigna and others. Well, it'll be interesting. We're going we're gonna to have to track what happens. We hear a lot about administrative costs already. We hear about pre-offs already. Um, and so if, if the MA footprint grows in the state, I guess we're going to be hearing more about that. And my worry, too, is that the cost shift will increase and commercially insured payers are going to bear more of that burden yeah. over time. So I think we just have to keep track of that. And you're highlighting that was important to me. Um, Dr. Paris, I, I have to say, you know, I, I, I hear you when you talk about a significant obstacle to delivery reform being the state's unwillingness to match some of those transformation funding from CMS. I don't disagree. I completely agree. In fact, I don't know if you recall, but the board wrote a letter I know. to the administration to that effect. And I guess what I just want to ask you about is we didn't receive a lot of corroboration support from hospitals at the time saying, yes, we agree. This is going to be a significant obstacle. Um, so I'm just wondering, what can hospitals be doing to convey that message to the folks who hold the purse strings, which we, we don't with respect to those dollars being drawn down from the federal government? So when I hear it, I think, yeah, well, we tried. <laughs> yeah. What can hospitals be doing and, wh and why didn't they do it at the time? Well, I, I mean, I know we did. <laughs> uh, and, I, uh, you know, it's it's a there were changes in leadership right um as well um and i i still kind of think that our the aco as we constructed it was really um it, it was the best we could do at at the time um but was not not the perfect vehicle for a rural health a rural health network which we'll just call vermont a rural a rural health network for the most part i think cms has come up with um newer models for rural health ACOs, which I, I'd, I'd love to be considered for, for version uh, 2.0 uh, of, of the ACO. Um, 
you know, I think we have a, we do have a model for what works pretty well uh, in with the Medicaid program. I, you know, if I can get Dave to support that, then you know that that that's an effective uh, an effective model to, to change how we deliver and reimburse for the care. Um, I, now, I remember sitting in meetings of the hospital association um, talking about the transformation funds that were available and then went away, and there was. You know, there was a lot of consternation, but you know, to a to a CEO, we were supportive of of the move. So um, I think there was reluctance to, you know, inject a poison pill into the process by saying, uh, you know, do we re really want to be the folks saying no to to payment reform? No. So there was some sitting on of sitting on of hands and some teeth gnashing, but we it was kept. Um, private, but it's. I think we've seen the downstream effects uh, of that. It was, um, uh, you know, I, I think I'm editorializing here. I think the Greenmont Care Board has been more responsible for for uh, leveling off the rate of growth than the ACO has 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 been. And I think it's really hard to tease out. That's my personal opinion. I think it's hard to tease out. What really is it? Is it the uh, caps on NPR growth, or is it population health? I don't, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't think we can say that right now. But a hundred million dollars is a lot of transformation funds. That's that's nurses. That's broadband. That that's stuff to do. Like I said earlier, to move to get to patients where they are. You know, I I think we built the. The ACO around a model of keeping people out of the hospital and getting them in the clinics. I'm not sure that's the model five years from now. I think it's out of hospitals, out of clinics. I think it's at home and urgent care and all ambulatory sensitive conditions being treated at home, not even coming into bricks and mortar. Um, uh, so I think that's where we should be thinking. And 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 you you know that's that's a hundred million bucks easy. <laughs> so I, I'm happy to carry the banner on that. And I, I so let me know, I, weaponize me. I'd like to, I'll, I'll, I'll do what I can. <laughs> well, let me, then I have one final question. Um, and it actually, re, it revolves around that, your vision for the next five years. I mean, you've overseen continued integration with Dartmouth Hitchcock over the years. And I'm wondering what lessons have you learned at a, Mount Scutney that can help our whole system move towards a more rational distribution of clinical services? What opportunities are you that have you seen that we can apply to the whole system for quality improvements or cost savings? I mean, I, you've learned so much, and I look at all these individual standalone hospitals, and I wonder what can be learned from integration, shared services, yeah. economy of scale, things like that. So, <laughs> I, uh, six months ago, I would have said. Shared services are incredible. They're great. I, now I, I still think they're that, but now that we're actually getting cost allocations for shared services across the system, it's uh, less great. When you're getting it for free, it's uh, much better. Um, but it still makes sense. I, I, I think what we have seen is more around expense reduction as opposed to truly rational uh, um, distribution of services. I think if, um, as our work with Valley continues, we'll be... Um, uh, in uh, kind of an incubator for that. We'll see how it works to have, you know, five days of oncology at one spot. Um, and, you know, but but orthopedics is somewhere else or urology is somewhere else, but it's a more robust program. Uh, right now, everything is still fractured clinically. I think where we've had the most bang for the buck in our system work um, has been in, the, in, in quality and safety and building a network across DHH focused on quality and safety and the patient experience and then better really you know better purchasing power um, you know in uh, for for insurance products for PPE for um, uh, kind of you, you you name the 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 back off you name the overhead right the, I'm a when our new CEO came in she said everything beyond the care of everything beyond the interaction between a provider and the patient is overhead and the strength of a system uh, and the health, the financial health of a system depends on the reduction of everything else, which is overhead. And she was pointing to all of us as leaders, your overhead, your overhead, your overhead, um, because it, it's true. I, later in the week, I'm, I'm working as a hospitalist, so I'm not overhead on those days, but every other day I am. Um, so I think that's where 
en uh, engagement with a larger system has has provided the most bang for the buck. That said, Dave pointed out earlier that you know we need cardiology care, but I don't need five days of cardiology care. I, I probably need two days, as you can tell from our wait times to get into the cardiologist. But it's better than than no one. Um, and it's like that for every specialty service um, that we that we have. Uh, and DH can't do it for for everyone that wants it. They don't have the bench depth. And uh, I, I think there's a move to focus on the the system. Um, DH operates in New Hampshire, so it's a different in environment. We're kind of the uh, we're sometimes on the outside looking in, uh, asking for for stuff um because we don't have the geographic benefits that some of the other system members do but we're we're, we're working on it um uh i think at my hope is that at next year's budget presentation i'm talking about more clinical service line work instead of the savings we got on uh paper clips and ppe for example i would add uh one thing and that would be that uh one of our hopes with with Valley and at the system, you know, the Dartmouth system, is to develop uh, kind of a internal travelers um, that could be assigned to multiple facilities, which is why the IT integration becomes a little bit more critical because we can share staff and the the operating system is the same no matter where they go. Um, but uh, we're we've already talked, we've already covered some shifts for Valley and uh, with some side deals with them and they've all they've uh, subsidized some of our services as well here and there so we've been doing these small experiments to see do they work and you know when you're when you're bringing in a traveler from across the country well there's a rent a car there's hotel there's three squares a day there's all these costs whereas if it's somebody who lives in cornish new hampshire works at valley um, you know, we take a lot of those unnecessary costs off aside from the egregious hourly costs. So, um, you know, those are the things that we're trying to figure out. You know, if we have one extra respiratory therapist in the area who can cover for vacation, sick days, uh, vent patients, these types of things, you know, what are the savings of that? What, what, what does that really translate to? And I think we're making some small incremental progress towards that. Great, thank you. I always learn a lot from your presentation and I did today. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Joe, um, in the past, you guys have described uh, a better payer mix coming from the other side of the uh, Connecticut River um, as far as your uh, patients. And um, with the construction that's happening at DH and the fact that you're traditionally getting all those referrals, especially for rehab, are you concerned about an impact on your uh, your revenues? Um, more on staffing, honestly. I think I think all those patients that are getting acute care at DH, um, those that need acute rehab and swing stays, are all going to come to us um, uh, as they have before, as long as we have open beds because of staffing. Um, I would say that. Uh, the workforce is a critical issue for the system. We're engaged in um, a number of, of projects. There is a massive amount of planning and strategy being developed to bring more people to the area. We need more workers. Um, the that the 80 bed tower alone, like I said, is probably a couple hundred nurses and support staff. I mean, the, where are we going to to get those? And DH has been thinking differently about that. They've they've um, uh, I don't want to say use have a controlling interest. They they are in, get actively engaged with a local college um, in New Hampshire to to bring more uh, medical services staff and really change the curriculum there so that it's rad techs and therapies and and nurse and, and, and not just nurses. Um, but we need more people. So that means we also need to address the housing issue. We need to address the transportation issue. Um, you know, I know how we're suffering locally. The rents, the rents in Windsor are a few hundred bucks less than the rents in Hanover. I mean, that's that that's brutal. Um, uh, no one can afford to buy a house anywhere. We're, we've recruited staff from the Midwest who stayed a year and a half and left because they couldn't buy a house uh, in even in Windsor with with you know with our with a, our 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 payer mix and what has historically been more affordable housing. Um, that's that's my bigger. Um, uh, concern. I, I think our 
I think the patients are still going to come. I think um, uh, that the, I'm not worried about that. It's uh, how do we care for them is is the bigger issue. We have an aging workforce uh, of uh, nursing. Um, average age, I think, is in the upper 50s here. Um, you know, we've uh, when every year when we do our benefits, we kind of we're aghast when we see how uh, how old our workforce is um, just at our hospital. Um, so we, we we've got to we've got to fix that. That's a that's a Vermont, New Hampshire issue. We've got to bring in more people. Um, On the other side of the river, are you seeing um, one of the, the the drawbacks here in Vermont to um, fully maximize the nursing programs is the inability for um, uh, maximizing clinical placements for the students. And is that a problem on the other side of the river, just as it is on our side or? Yeah, I think I think you've um, heard similar stories. It, it, the, the, the trouble has been attracting and keeping nurse educators. You've, we've got this uh, nursing schools have had to um, limit in, in uh, the size of incoming classes because they don't have anyone to teach them. Um, so, you know, we looked at that and we actually hired, um, we worked with our local community college and said, I know you, it's expensive for you to hire a nurse educator. We'll, we'll supplement that so that the job is more attractive. Nurse educators don't get paid as much as a nurse working on the floor does. So who would do it? So we worked with a local college to supplement that comp and just um, uh, cover that so that it's an attractive job and we'll keep educators. So we, we, we've had a recent influx because of that. And I think that's something that we're probably going to have to build out. Um, you know, we've had, a, as you've seen, a bit of a financial tailwind in, in 21. So things that have been on the wish list as far as that, like, you know, we don't, that's a three year down the road benefit of an investment. Now we've actually been able to make that investment. And hopefully that leads to more new nurses, um, you know, two and a half years on our down the road on our units. But that's a classic example of of if you just patient and make the investment, it, it should work. But that's a it's a structural issue. There's not enough nurse educators on both sides of the river. Well, we try to pull from both. You talked about the um, issues at the assisted living facility. What's the the uh, compensation differential for um, Working at the assisted living versus hospital-based. Yeah, it's it's varied. Um, we the the medical assistants or patient care assistants down there actually um, make as much of, if not more, than what they do here at the hospital. Um, this is an example of where the our, our health system, larger health system, has made decisions to raise the the floor on the uh, lowest paid jobs within our organizations. So they've all moved up to $14.50, $15. Locally at, at the assisted living, we've moved it up even, even higher. Um, it is, uh, uh, we've had to, our, our, our nursing staff there, um, there's not a lot of them, but we've, we've had to um, pr uh, provide a premium there um, as well to keep the staffing. Um, you know, we, the bigger issue with his, uh, historic homes is we made a decision about five years ago to do what we did at Escutney seven years ago. We said, let's just fill it up. Let's not worry if, if it's a private pay or a government payer. Let's just, let's just bring it in. And so most of the patients down there are government payers, which if you talk to people that run assisted living facilities, they'll say, what are you doing? That's no one does that. Um, and so we've been able to do it on a shoestring and it's a va it's the most affordable assisted living, you know, within 50 miles of this place. Uh, and it has a, a lot of residents in it. Um, but that's a, that's a tough business model, uh, to sustain. Um, I think what's your per diem reimbursement there for Medicaid? Oh gosh, I don't want to hazard a guess, Kevin. I, I let, let, let me get that for you and, and and so what we what we've done though within medicaid is we've gotten waivers so that we can take sicker medicaid patients there don't quite beat nursing home but clearly can't be at home so we get some added um uh payment for caring for those patients and that that's like someone with a feeding tube or someone that uh has mobility issues or advanced nursing care um 
uh, that's allowed us to again to meet the needs of the community. But even even with that that enhanced reimbursement, that's not that's not covering our 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 costs down there. So we um, we we can get we'll get a breakdown of that and and send it over to you. So Thank it's you. it's sixty dollars, no. sixty dollars a day average average resident regardless of payer source. So it's like it's like better than staying at the holiday and you just don't get smarter. <laughs> so Dave, you guys should work on that because that's at the pretty low end if if uh what I'm looking at some of the uh um daily reimbursements uh um you know that's that's real low. <laughs> Well, but you know, the other part of it is when you, you multiply that by 30 days, that's $1,800. And, um, you know, this isn't Wake Robin. Um, uh, and uh, so they're not paying for that level of quality. And, and we, uh, except for when we tightened up during the pandemic, our occupancy is actually pretty high and is usually a, a small uh, waiting list. So, you know, and we've got people who are in there and have been paying rates. So, to, you know, sit there and say, well, we're going to have a 20% uh, rate increase to get to market uh, when you've got, you know, Nana's been paying $1,800 a month, you know, and then with, you know, three to 5% increases annually, uh, we're going to have a lot of upset families. So. Okay. Now I'm going to turn the uh, questioning over to the Healthcare Advocates Office. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'll be really brief because I know we're tight on time and I want to ensure the public has time to weigh into. If you hear a groan, that's a puppy in the background. So hopefully it's pretty <laughs> remains quiet. Um, so I just want to thank the team Mount of Scutney for all that you do, particularly during the pandemic. We're grateful. Um, I know it's a challenge each and every day as cases continue to rise with Delta. Also want to commend you for prioritizing race equity in your work and for answering the pre-hearing questions during the presentation. And I know you mentioned uh, your willingness to share your health disparities data. We'd love to look at this data with you if possible, so we can touch base uh, after this perhaps, because um, this is a focus area for our office. So I just have one question on behalf of our office. There was a high profile piece in the Sunday edition of the New York Times about the tremendous variation in hospital and insurer prices for the same product or service across the country. I was wondering if you saw this article and if so, could you provide any comment about how it may apply or not apply to Vermont? And if you didn't see it, if you have any explanation for this variation in prices for the same service. Thanks. Yeah, so I, 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 I'll I, speak for myself, did, did uh, read it with interest. Um, went throughout the article saying, yep, that's us. No, that's not us. Yes, that's us. I would say, yes, that's us and most other hospitals with different uh, uh, prices, uh, depending on payer. No, in the, that it's not us in, in regards to transparency um, and how we submit our data. And if can, yeah, I think a lot of hospitals said, okay, we're gonna do the, if they decided to post their prices, we're gonna do the, bare minimum it's going to be unusable no one can no one can actually interpret what it means um, we did not do that um, because we're not on the dh's uh reporting systems right now we had to uh, do it our own way but it's still compliant across the system i think it's still a difficult uh document and collection of data to read through um I think we have less variation than some of the real egregious examples in that Times article. And I'd ask uh, Dave to chime in on this one because we, we deal yeah. with this every day. Yeah, I, I think, you know, when we worked on our, our price decreases, um, you know, we, we did look at how we get paid by different payers for different yeah. services and all that. And, and in the emails that I sent to Patrick and Lori about the decreases that we had enacted and the ones that will follow in the next uh, days or, or a week or two, um, you know, there, our charge master is irrational. And uh, because, you know, you've got 40, 50 years of changing technology, you know, something that legitimately on a cost accounting basis might cost $500 to deliver. Um, well, 20 years ago, it might have cost 
$700 because the tech technology wasn't as efficient or quick. And so you've got all of that. Plus, oh my gosh, we're having a bad year. Let's raise our prices up 7%, right? You've got, you've got all of this nonsense. And when I went down, I went down to a study per study level uh, to review this stuff. And, uh, you know, what, what I discovered is that the reimbursement uh, we do have some fee schedules from commercial payers for outpatient work. Um, those fee schedules are as irrational as as our charges. So um, I don't know. It's a chicken and the egg. I don't know if it was the commercial payers' fault or our fault. So I'll I'll say it was both our fault. Um, but I, I think what we've done with those services we mentioned earlier is actually rationalize them. So. If something is two times the effort of another thing, it costs twice as much. And we've tried to do that. And now I'm going back to the payers who give us fee schedules for some of those services and asking them to rationalize that as well. Um, so that'll be phase two. We could have actually done more if the fee schedule was more rational, um, but it, it wasn't. So um, plenty of work to do there, Sam. Thank you. Back to you, Chair Mellon. Thank you so much, Sam. Now I'm going to open it up to public comment on the Mount Scutney budget. Is there any member of the public who wishes to offer public comment? Well, Mike Fisher, you could have just spoken. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I just take a, a human moment here. I also appreciate Mass Gutney for, for your answers. Um, um, I, uh, just a human moment. Uh, uh, Dave, I think you may have announced a few minutes ago that you just became a great grandfather. How is that possible? And congratulations. For, for everyone who knows me, I do everything uh, unconventionally and backwards, <laughs> and it always works out okay at the end. And so, yes, I am a great grandfather. This will be number four, actually. And, um, and, and I believe that a CEO of another Vermont hospital has made an accommodation so that my wife and I can continue to have an empty nest and uh, uh, not have a crying newborn in our house tonight. So <laughs> thank you, you know who you are. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh, is there any other public comment? Hearing none, uh, again, I want to thank uh, the team from Mount Scutney and uh, um, very well presented budget. And uh, we'll be back to you uh, in September. So Great. thank you very much. At thank this you. point, I'm going to put this meeting into recess for 10 minutes and we will return at um, at uh, 11.03 and we'll start with Copley at that point. Thank you. Thank you.